Anytime I use brand names or specific products or stores, or anything like that, just understand it's not an endorsement by myself nor the university. It is just a way for us to communicate, be familiar. Uh, and so it's not a warranty guarantee or anything like that. So we're basically going to talk about reducing pests and really we're going to probably focus a little more on disease than on insects, but we'll talk about both because really we're going to approach this from a standpoint of what does a spray program look like for backyard fruit production. Uh, and so we'll talk about some different aspects of that. That being said, we are going to talk a lot about pesticides. And so I don't want you to think that we're anti-organic or we don't work with organic growers. I actually managed an organic certifier for four and a half years for the state of Kentucky. Uh, so I'm very familiar and very happy to work with organic uh, homeowners or producers. Um, and so when there's some good options for us on the organic world, because sometimes a misconception people have is organic is the complete absence of input. So they're not using fertilizers, they're not using pesticides. In truth, they are, it's just it's different products. Uh, and so sometimes we have great alternatives for that. In other areas, we don't have a good organic product to point you to. And so where there is one, I'll try to mention it uh, and we'll go from there. And certainly always happy to answer questions about organic controls. But you know, one of the big questions and you know, why are we even talking about pest control? Well, the fact is the environment we live in, it allows us to grow a number of different fruits. Those are also uh, environments that can grow a number of different pests, whether insects or diseases. And of course, you know, to me, insects, they're attracted to fruit for the very same reasons we are, sugar content. So, you know, it's that great rich source of calories for a pest and we love it for the flavor. So you may ask, can I grow fruit without having a spray program? You can, and there are certain uh, fruits we would recommend that you go that direction with, that you'd have greater likelihood of luck. Uh, but even with those, you're more likely to see a decrease in fruit quality. So if you want that picture perfect apple that you see at the grocery store, you're pretty much going to have to be doing some sort of spray program. And it can be very intensive or less so depending on your own preferences. Uh, but just understand the highest quality fruit is always going to be coming out of a orchard that has been uh, in a pest control program. The other thing is if we're not doing any sort of pest control, there may be some years without harvest. So there are some years that disease is just absolutely devastating to uh, our fruit production. There are some years that we have heavy insect pressure. And so there, there is the very real possibility of no harvest if we're not actively trying to do something. So as long as you're okay with that, it may not be the prettiest and there may not be something this year, then you don't have to spray. But if you wanna reliably get a good looking crop and a, a crop each season, chances are we need to at least do some minimal things uh, in the orchard, vineyard, and what would we call the brambles? We'll call them orchard too. Um, so, you know, just understand that. And so sometimes it's not that you have to do everything, but there are some things that are, you're gonna find are gonna be very helpful. One thing to keep in mind, we are talking about pests. And what we find universally, healthy plants are better able to resist diseases and insects. So if we can keep our plants as stress-free as possible, growing well and happy, they're gonna have a greater likelihood of resisting pests and attacks that do occur. So just understand that. So we wanna be good uh, gardeners or, or orchard men and women, and we wanna make sure that we're giving our plants what they need. And so we're not gonna go into a huge amount of depth to that tonight, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So thinking about things like fertility, are you getting good growth on your trees? If you're not getting a lot of growth, then maybe we need to look at increasing fertility because when we are making harvest, we're removing a lot of nutrients and we don't wanna just keep mining the soil for those nutrients we wanna put back with uh, different fertilizer options. When we talk about diseases and fruit, and really diseases overall, uh, basically we have causal agents. And so these are the fungi, bacteria, water molds, uh, which aren't quite fungi, so they kind of made their own category for them. Once upon a time, they were thought of just being fungi. We have viruses, and normally nematodes get uh, lumped into disease-causing agents with pathology, even though they're not exactly um, uh, what we think of as diseases per se, but they can absolutely transmit diseases as well as some insects. 
when we think about where do our disease problems come from, certainly we can bring them into our uh, planting on plants that we're buying. Some of these are existing already in the landscape. Some things can be very specific, so they'll only attack, uh, you know, perhaps apples and pears because they're related to each other. Other things are very more generalistic, and so they may have a wider host species. So sometimes it's just simply something that's in the background of the environment. And because of that, there's an opportunity when we plant our plants there to have a negative exposure. But we also have to think about if we do have disease and what happens to it? How does it come back the next year? So survival and persistence of disease uh, can be in different ways. Sometimes it's on a living plant. So there are some diseases that they have to be on something living to be able to overwinter and to stay around. Other things can be on dead material. So this is when we talk about sanitation in our gardens, uh, you know, whether it's a vegetable garden at the end of the season, removing those plants when they're done, whether it's, you know, raking up the apple leaves or blowing them out of the orchard or using a mulching mower to chop them up, because we can have some of these pest diseases actually stay uh, on those materials over winter and next spring, that's where the disease is coming from. So sometimes it's material that's in our orchard. And so if we do a good job with sanitation, we can really reduce the disease pressure. Uh, there's also uh, different uh, pathogens that produce survival structures. You can think of these kind of analogous to seeds in that they're overwintering structures that they grow from in the subsequent season. So some things do create these structures. They have different names depending on what uh, species we're talking about, but sometimes that's what's left behind. So one of the things to take away from this is the sanitation of fruit plantings. And I would say all garden plantings is important to reduce disease pressure for us because we want to set ourselves up for success. If you ever hear a talk about diseases and plants, you'll probably see th this disease triangle. And all it says is that when we have a susceptible host, if we have a pathogen present and environmental conditions that are conducive to the disease, then we're going to have it. And so what we would like to do is modify any one of the three of those things so that we don't get the disease. So for instance, if we have a host that is not susceptible to the disease, it doesn't matter if the pathogen there or if it's the perfect environment for the disease. Uh, by the same token, if we modify the environment and uh, even though we have a pathogen and a susceptible host, we're not gonna see disease. So if we can modify these or change some of our practices in the garden, this can allow us to reduce the chance of disease. So, you know, all of this we've been talking about is not just going out and spraying something. We're wanting to do things in a smart way so we can minimize what we have to do. One of the big things we can do is select varieties that have resistance. And so resistance is not immunity. There are some apple varieties that are considered, for instance, immune to scab, apple scab, but that's probably the one disease I can think of that we truly have that. Uh, so, you know, immunity gives us some protection. It will generally lessen the severity. It will be later in the season that we see negative effects, but it gives us, again, a step in the right direction. So anytime we can look at uh, resistant varieties, that's what we wanna be putting out there in our gardens and orchards. What's good is there are both uh, modern uh, bread varieties as well as heirloom varieties that have some of these characteristics. So it doesn't mean that you can't grow an heirloom apple, for instance, there are some good ones out there. We also need to think about suitability to our area. And so for me, this is more focusing on chilling hours. So the way um, many of our fruit plants work is once they reach a minimum number of hours below a certain temperature, they are ready to bloom. And so in our area, typically we're anywhere from 13, 1400 hours conservatively, typically we'll get more than that. That's kind of where we are for this part of Tennessee. And so what that means is if we have uh, two plants, one of them has chilling hour requirements of 800 hours and the other one has 1300 hours, the 800 hour one blooms first. And the problem is spring frost. So what happens in the worst years where we see the most damage from spring frost is we get a lot of chilling hours in a hurry and then we get unseasonably warm weather. And so everybody says, hey, it's time to bloom, it's time to grow. And so they start putting out early and we see flowers early happening on our plants. And then we get our regularly scheduled spring frost. That happens not to be late 
and it kills everything. And it's because an overwintering plant that's dormant is extremely uh, tolerant of uh, freeze injury. Uh, you know, we'll certainly see some damage in our landscapes from uh, the uh, Arctic air that we had around Christmas. We're going to see that. So a lot of crepe myrtles may be killed back to the ground. Japanese maples are probably going to see some severe problems. Um, I know like last year we had snapdragons overwintering in the planters out front of our office. They're not overwintering this year. Uh, and so it's things like that that we see. And so if it happens early in the season, it's not a big deal because things are dormant and they're okay. We don't like that dramatic drop we saw, but I don't think we'll see ginormous impacts from that on our fruit. Uh, but the worst thing is if we start getting warm spring weather too early this spring. And I'm afraid if we see that, then we might see more problems. So what we want to do with this when we're selecting, again, we're looking for resistance, and then we're also looking for things that have higher chill requirements. So there are some uh, things. So for instance, I was at a training, I think two years ago that UT did, and the fruit specialist actually had an apple tree that he had purchased at a big box store in Middle Tennessee. And it was a variety that probably should have not have been planted north of Palm Beach, Florida. <laughs> it had an extremely low chilling hour requirement. It was going to never produce in Tennessee, uh, but it was for sale in Tennessee. So sometimes some of this, I'll have to be honest, you're going to have to do some research on your own and consider. And if it's not a variety that's recommended for our area, there may be a reason to pass on it. Uh, and so, you know, maybe big box retailers are not the best place to get things, but I've seen good uh, products come out of there too. And generally on the label, does it say that? It, it will not generally out? say on the label whether it's a uh, a specific chilling hour that I've seen. What it may show sometimes is whether it's an early or late bloomer kind of bloom periods. That can give you a little bit of an idea, but it probably won't. And so this is where in my mind an idea to go with is to look at here are several lists and I'm, you're going to have access to several recommendation lists that uh, have varieties that would do well. And so if it's completely absence on all those lists, I'd want to find out more before I invested money into that particular variety. Um, so it's not to say there can't be a good variety that's not on those lists, but I would wonder why is it absent. And sometimes those lists don't get updated as much as we would like. Um, so, I mean, there's some good reasons why it wouldn't be there, but understanding that chill hours and higher chill hours mean later blooming and later blooming typically means more likely to escape a spring frost. Now, never say never. I've seen when I was in Kentucky one year, I think it was like May 17th or May 21st, they got down to like 32 degrees in Lexington. It happens, but it's not the usual event. But we know most time we're going to see a frost event in April. And so if things are too far advanced, we're going to see more damage. Another thing to talk about, and it's actually going to be the topic of our next uh, class, is pruning. So pruning is critical because one of the best things we do with pruning is open a tree up or even our vines to greater air and sunlight penetration. And so basically wet surfaces are more attractive to disease development. So when we water, we don't want to wet our plants, uh, but we also want to make sure we get good air circulation and good sun exposure through pruning. The number one thing I see with people is they don't prune enough or they never prune. And so that's bad. I'd rather you make a few mistakes pruning and the plant lives as opposed to do nothing and end up with a mess that's really hard to do something with five or 10 years down the road. Uh, and honestly, there's a few rule of thumbs we'll talk about that will get you set on the right road to pruning. If you just do only those, you'll be much better off. Sometimes we want to consider to fruit thinning. Trees can do what is called biennial bearing. And so this is where you have a great big crop and the next year a little crop. What happens is the same time that that tree is filling those fruit on the tree, they're also creating the floral buds for next year. So if all the resources are going to fruit, there's few flowers next year. Then, then that next year, suddenly there's very little fruit. So you have a tremendous amount of buds created. And so you get into this alternate bearing or biennial bearing where every two years you have a great crop and in between you don't. Some of this is a variety influence. So things like honey crisp, 
are one that's very hard to manage. Uh, commercial growers do not like to grow Honeycrisp at all. It's not a good apple to grow. I would not recommend it to grow in our area. It's not going to do great. I know it's been for sale in our area, but I would never recommend somebody grow Honeycrisp. Um, great flavor, but it is a pain to grow. It is not a good one to have. Uh, and so the way we get around biennial bearing, because we will have frost events to where you don't have much fruit one year. And so that's setting you up for this problem the next season. You can actually thin fruit and you should thin the fruit. Most of the time trees set more. They do this naturally. If you ever heard of a June drop on apples or if you've ever been around apple trees in June, you see all these green apples on the ground. You're like, oh my goodness. It's a natural thing. The trees will actually thin some, but there's uh, obviously physical thinning we can do. Also some chemicals we can use to do that. Uh, so the insecticide carbaryl is one that can be used to do that. Carbaryl used to be marketed under the name seven. It's an old organophosphate insecticide. Seven is now a completely different chemical product. So that's why I refer to it as carbaryl because that's the actual chemical name. So just be aware of that. And that's also why we wouldn't use carbaryl as an insect control in our orchards, uh, especially early in the fruiting cycle. So when we look at approaching a pest control program, what we need to understand is basically there are things to do related to pest control throughout the entire season. So that's pre-bloom, even in the dormant season. Then there's periods uh, during the bloom, cover sprays, which are after the bloom, but before harvest. And even depending on exactly what trees we're talking about, some post-harvest actions we may do for pest control. So just understand it's not a once and done thing. And that's the challenge with this. It has to be sustained over the season to get the full effect. Uh, one thing I do want to stress, uh, regardless of anything I say, anything you find on the internet, the pesticide label, which is literally the label on the pesticide product, is the law and must be followed. So even if I tell you the wrong thing, you're supposed to be reading that label and determining the proper directions. Hopefully I won't tell you anything wrong, but just understand that regardless of what someone with a huge following on YouTube says, if the label doesn't tell you you can do that, you probably shouldn't. Another thing to consider is that pest control is best approached preventatively. Uh, there are certainly some curative type products we may have, particularly with insects, where if we see a, a population building, we can get it under control. But particularly with diseases, there aren't products that cure a disease. So at minimum, we may arrive on the scene, have a problem and keep it from spreading to new growth but that growth that is already damaged is not going to be fixed. Uh, and so we do like thinking of these things more as a shield where they need to be in place before we have the problem uh, develop. The schedule that we have in here, uh, you know, it can be more or less frequent. So it is probably a little conservative, which is not a bad thing, but certainly a lot of this is also driven by weather. So wet seasons, we're going to see more disease problems, very dry seasons, fewer problems. Um, the other thing to consider is rotating our products. So basically we'll be talking about some different pest control, like disease products, like fungicides. And while you may be able to use one fungicide all season long, from a resistance standpoint, it's good to use more than one product. So where we have multiple products that are allowed for use, probably makes sense to either alternate their use or use one for several weeks and then switch to the other. And not every product is equally effective on every pest. So that also means if there's a product that maybe is a little weak on cedar apple rust, you can use a different product that might be stronger, that has its own weaknesses. So the ability to use more than one product is a good thing. And again, you'll hear me say this multiple times tonight, off-season sanitation is important. So whether it's chopping up those leaves so they degrade fast, whether it's removing the mummy fruit on trees, and we'll have some pictures, uh, all those sorts of things are very important to reduce that disease pressure. So first off, we'll jump into apples and pears, because really apples especially is the thing I get the most questions on, and pears being related, uh, they have a lot of commonalities. So there's a lot of different possible diseases we'll see pretty commonly. Uh, they're the different apple rust, and there's more than one, apple scab, fire blight, sooty blotch, and fly speck, uh, which are kind of interesting and different. 
Uh, but the rust, so there's actually more than one. A lot of people know cedar apple rust, but there's also hawthorn apple rust and even quince apple rust. So why is it having two plants in the name? Well, what happens is in that first upper left picture, you see the kind of orangey thing growing on a cedar branch. So that is actually a gall. You've got a rust infection there and it produces those kind of jelly looking tentacles and those release spores. Those spores travel to apple trees and that's where we start getting the leaf infections that you see there as well as it can infect fruit directly. And that's how apples get damaged. But what's interesting is when those spots start to produce spores, they don't infect apples. So there's no reinfection here. What happens is these travel to cedar trees and infect cedar trees or hawthorns or quinces, depending on the specific rust we're looking at. And so what it is, they have alternating hosts. Uh, and so because of that, this is one that we wanna take care of at the beginning of bloom period. That's when we're gonna see this coming in. So we like to see fungicides then. And again, we're preventing that infection coming from the cedars. Because even if we have these uh, disease leaves on the apples, they're never gonna be producing spores that infect apples. It's always gonna be going back to that alternate host, cedar, hawthorn, or quince. So interesting that there's alternate hosts for this. Uh, and so, it, and it, practically speaking, you know, sometimes people ask, well, I know I've got cedar trees. Should I cut them down? No, because there's plenty of cedar trees around. So you removing cedar trees on your property is unlikely to mean that you'll never see cedar apple rust. So certainly you're welcome to, and it may reduce the pressure a little bit, but the reality is if you have no cedar trees on your property or in your neighborhood that you see, you're very likely to have cedar apple rust just because it's out there. Apple scab is a disease that it's a little bit different because we actually can get secondary infections. So what this means is typically we get the initial infections showing up on leaves. It's coming from leftover debris from last year. So infected leaves or even fruit uh, that stayed in the orchard, that can be where this is coming from. We want to look for resistant cultivars because we have, again, near immunity to this disease on several cultivars. And cultivars are just a contraction of cultivated varieties. So you may see that as you uh, look in gardening stuff. Uh, so you can just substitute in variety. Um, we still like to use fungicide sprays, even if we do a good job with sanitation, because we do know this is out there. And it can be very damaging. And the worst thing about it is you get a leaf infected, it starts creating spores, and it's going to spread to the rest of the tree, to the fruit on the tree. So that's where this is one that we definitely, if we see it happening, we should react to it because we don't want to see this one spread further. Fire blight is a bacteria and we see this not just on our uh, fruiting trees, but we can actually even see this on um, the uh, ornamental pears, like Bradford pears, which nobody should ever plant, by the way. Uh, so uh, I'm happy when I see it on Bradford pears, but um, th the reality is what happens is this bacteria, uh, it actually enters in through the nectaries of the flower. So there is a uh, preventative, and you can spray streptomycin, and it is the antibiotic during the bloom period. Most of the time, it's not a huge issue. We have a lot of resistant root stocks that trees are on. So you will very much see different reactions to this if you have multiple varieties in the orchard, because you may see some varieties that don't have any fire black going on, and some that has tremendous amounts of it. And it is because there is resistance to it. So certainly a lot of root stocks that are commonly used have it. And root stocks on apples is just the root part. And then we graft in the top part of the fruit we want. Uh, so if you have dwarf trees or semi-dwarf trees, those are going to be grafted because the dwarfing is coming from the root stock. Um, and so we see this typical damage where we see uh, what's called flagging. Uh, and so that's where you get kind of the shepherd's crooking of those branch tips. They turn dark brown, 
Very, very often the leaves stay attached. It's pretty distinctive. Uh, and then it spreads. So it enters in through those nectaries of the flowers. It spreads down the branches. And this can actually kill trees. So, you know, if this enters into main trunks, main branches, you can lose that branch over time. And so we can't actually have trees killed this way. This is one reason why when we're pruning, we don't want little small branches on our main trunk, because if those were to be affected or infected by fire blight, it can be directly into the main trunk of the tree and that's dangerous. Uh, that's how we lose trees. So we don't want to see that happen. So that's one reason why we prune those out. So, it's one that by and large, we do manage decently well with uh, resistant varieties. And in truth, ordinarily we don't see backyard growers spray much for it. Uh, and so probably I think managing with varieties and what we do is when we do have it happen, because if you have an orchard, you're gonna have fire blight occasionally, even if you use resistant varieties. So what we do is when we prune, we cut this out. And so we'll actually cut six to eight inches below any visible infection. And by doing that, uh, we're removing it. Because again, we don't want it to spread once it shows up. And when you're in the branch tips, we can get it out before it gets to a main branch or even the trunk itself. So if you do have the option for spray control, not commonly. And again, if we do a good job with pruning, I think that's probably a better management strategy than, sp than spraying streptomycin. So sooty blotch and fly speck. I love the names, uh, but what's interesting about it, this is just completely superficial and it's two different things. So you see the kind of large olivey spots on the surface of that apple, that is sooty blotch. The fly speck is the little dark specks you see. What's interesting is you can occasionally find these showing up on other things. Uh, one time I saw fly speck on, I think it was, summer squash. Yeah, it was yellow summer squash. Don't ask me why. And, and it's not a important disease of summer squash or anything like that, because it is just superficial. It is just uh, the case that it's found a place to grow. It probably is deriving some nutrition from that apple, but it doesn't hurt you. So you will see this on trees that aren't under a spray program for diseases. So if you've got an apple tree in the back 40 in a fence row, you're very likely to see this on those apples. Really, you know, if you're doing any sort of fungicide program, you're going to take care of this and you're probably not going to see it. Even if you do see it, it's not damaging to the tree. It's not damaging to us to eat it. Uh, so, you know, utilizing strategies like pruning so we get better drying of everything is probably better than rushing out and spraying fungicides because we begin to see uh, this on our fruit. Will you be discussing a timeline on spraying? We will. Yep. And in fact, John, that's what's going to happen next. <laughs> so if we talk about insects for just a moment, again, this is definitely more heavy, I think, on uh, diseases purposefully because Honestly, what I've seen in my experience, we're much more likely to see a devastating loss from disease than from pests. Now, don't get me wrong, insects are going to cause damage and they can be significant. So I'm not saying don't control for those. But if you said which one would you focus on, I'd probably look at diseases first. Um, so we do have things that we can target like aphids, bite, and scale, or plant bugs that are overwintering either as adults or as eggs. So there are some strategies there we can use uh, to get those before we enter into season. The big thing with insect control, we never, ever, ever use insecticides during bloom because we have to protect our pollinators. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, you know, there are some things that point to other even like fungicide products maybe having sometimes a negative effect on pollinators. So we don't necessarily want to spray just for the fact of it uh, when it, we're in the bloom period, but we must abstain from utilizing insecticides. And in fact, that's what the labels legally require us to do. Uh, during the cover period, which are those periods after bloom, there are a number of different insect pests we can see. So plum curculio, if you've ever seen kind of little crescent moon shaped damage on apples, that's plum curculio. There's coddling moth, plant bugs, aphids, leaf rollers. They'll, you'll actually see them roll leaves on the tree and there'll be like the silk netting in there and then oriental fruit moth as well. 
So you will see lots of times whenever we are looking at uh, spray programs, they don't give you a date by which to spray because from year to year, it is going to vary. Instead, they talk about the stage of development. And so this is an apples that is included in our spray guide. And so you'll see things like dormant. They talk about silver tip, which if you look at the buds, they actually start getting a silver tip to them. Green tip has a green tip and so on. And so you will actually see these different stages of development. Uh, and one thing that's important to note is these different stages of development have uh, greater sensitivity to frost damage uh, or uh, they get damaged at a higher temperature as they develop. So dormant again has great resistance against that, um, but as we get further along in development, they get less resistant. So they get damaged at a higher temperature. So pre-bloom, what are we talking about doing? Well, a dormant spray uh, that we can do just when the buds are beginning to swell, so that we're even early for this right now, we can do something like uh, a horticultural oil or dormant oil. These are literally mineral oil products that they smother those overwintering insects and their eggs. Uh, so this is a good one, especially for individuals that wish to be uh, organic. You can absolutely find these products in the organic form. Um, you, another thing you can also use is copper. Copper is a natural uh, fungicide uh, as well as bactericide. So it can help reduce some of the overwintering levels of those uh, disease pests. So we like to see that. Uh, copper is particularly good on apples because of fire blight. So if you've had fire blight and you know you've got fire blight, that's a good one to go ahead and include. You can actually include those together in the spray tank. Uh, and so you can actually apply both of those at the same time. They can be mixed. As the tree is developing, as we're getting to uh, bud break or silver tip, what we start seeing then is we see captan, which is a fungicide for scab control. So this goes back to early in that season, we're wanting to prevent um, those leaves from being infected because they're going to turn around and infect fruit once it's there. So we're wanting to get that protection in place. As we're progressing to pink, as those blooms are just beginning to open, we're still using fungicides such as captan or immunox, which is another um, different fungicide. And again, there's certainly nothing wrong with uh, rotating. And particularly if we have cedar apple rust, which I think would include our areas and probably be a high priority, I would suggest that you use immunox over captan. So I don't wanna make you buy multiple products, but I think Immunox uh, is a better product for uh, cedar apple rust. Uh, and so I would like to see that used uh, in this scenario. We can start doing some uh, insecticides uh, for insect control. So malathion, uh, esfenvalerate, or permethrin. Uh, any of those products can be used. Uh, we do, again, we want to make sure that we're not letting these applications get into the period of bloom. So we are still before bloom. Those blooms are not open. So just make sure that we don't go too late with this. I'd rather you skip an insecticide spray if you're not sure, as opposed to kill your pollinators. And, and I'm sure most of you would too. Is the permethrin you're talking about the same stuff we would use in a it is. So permethrin is broadly used across agriculture in different strengths and formulations. So you would have to use a product that is labeled for use on apples, for instance. Uh, but yeah, the active ingredient is used across agriculture in a number of different ways. It's, it's a widely used product. So uh, when it comes to apples during the bloom period, this is when we might spray streptomycin. Uh, Absolutely no insecticides. And really, um, again, this is one I don't often see. You all make the choice for yourself. When we start to get post bloom, so what we start seeing is like when most of the petals, so let's say 75% of the petals have fallen, we're again still continuing those disease sprays. Again, alternating uh, on fungicides like captan or immunox. Typically, we're looking at spraying about every two weeks. Sometimes that can be shortened. You have to look at the product you're using. Generally, they will give you a range like seven to 14 days or 10 to 14 days. So you do have to abide by that. 
Uh, but certainly if you're having a lot of wet weather, you might want to tighten that down so you're getting more frequent applications simply because uh, rain will uh, wash away some of that protection. And if it's very dry, you may be able to even stretch that some. Uh, and so we also look at some insecticides to use during this period. Again, myothion, uh, gamma cyhalothrin, and spinosad. Spinosad is an organic product. So uh, just be aware that that is one for those who might be looking at doing organic sprays. One thing to understand about malathion is there are limitations about how many applications you can make per year. So you're not going to be able to rely on malathion only as an insecticide. You'd have to use something else or just skip insecticides during those periods after you've maxed out. Continuing cover sprays, the same thing, both fungicides as well as uh, insecticides and, and the malathion issue comes into spray. I don't know if any of you have ever used the all-in-one tree spray products, uh, which typically were a mix of captan and malathion. Uh, because of uh, the greater restrictions that have now applied to malathion, you cannot be using that all season long and once you could. So just be aware of that if in the past that's been your go-to, uh, you will have to look at uh, utilizing a different product simply because you can't make that many applications of myothion. Uh, the other thing to know, we've been talking about apples. By and large, the same thing goes for pears. There's one difference. I'm not exactly sure why there's a difference, um, but there is actually a lesser restriction when using it on pears than on apples, if I remember correctly. I think maybe that's the next slide. Yeah, so the big difference we find with pears is you don't have the disease control products that you do on apples. So for instance, Captan is not labeled for use on pears, even though they are both in the same plant family, they do not appear on the label. So typically what we see, the only products that can be used on pear are copper, sulfur, and streptomycin. Again, streptomycin would be used during the bloom period to prevent fire blight. Uh, we do want to be careful when we're using sulfur. We can burn plants with it. We never want to use copper and sulfur together. Um, so just be aware of that. Make sure you read the labels. That should be very clearly indicated on that. And again, there on the bottom, you see that uh, notation about that the uh, pear restriction for that particular product is actually less restrictive than apples. Uh, so again, always read the label, don't assume just because pears and apples are similar that everything's uh, approved for one versus the other because there are differences. And I'm, I'm not to sharp the knife in the room, but I got a question. Sure. This bonine eight, that's sort of an eight way, it has what you need in there to put on the pear from free bloom, free bloom. So I'm not certain I'd have to look up the product. It is not an eight way product. Uh, I know in, in other agriculture examples, when they do put a number in there, I believe that was called eight as a play on the product of seven. If seven's good, eight must be better. <laughs> I really believe that. Uh, I've not had anybody tell me I'm wrong on that, so I'll keep saying that. Um, but no, it, it, we do have in other ag products where a number in the name is very indicative or descriptive of it. I don't think that is. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, they're saying that the product can be used up to 14 days prior to harvest. So I'm not for sure. That one is not malathion, I don't believe. But I'd have to look up what the active ingredient is because I don't know off the top of my head. But again, this is where I'm going to always point you back to the label. If you call me with a question, I'm going to look up the label um, because that is important to make sure we get that right. So what about the stone fruit? So peaches, plums, and cherries, um, they can be challenging. So uh, particularly in the disease world, but also even insects, brown rot, which is absolutely devastating for peaches, probably our number one problem. I firmly believe that if you are not actively controlling diseases, you will not have peaches because of brown rot. I've not been disproven yet. Uh, very rarely will you get a good peach crop, maybe even any peaches hardly, if you're not actively controlling diseases. That's primarily because of brown rot. Uh, black knot can be a problem. Peach leaves curl, hmm, lesser problem. It typically is only dealt with on plums. Um, 
Insects, again, kind of the same general insects, aphids, mites, scales are all a possibility. I will say this, typically scale is not a huge issue in the backyard garden because um, there's a lot of um, natural predators that will eat it. So where we see scale show up is where we have very intensive insect control programs because we end up killing off some of the good guys as well as the bad guys. So there is something to be said to have a lighter touch sometimes on uh, insect control because we can kill off beneficial insects, even if we're not talking only pollinators, but also predators. Uh, there are a number of different insects that will happily uh, eat on our stone fruits. Uh, and so you see there are some of the same uh, insects we saw with apples, as well as some other things like peach tree borers uh, that will actually attack the trunk of our or in major branches of our trees. So brown rot. One thing I love about pathology and even uh, with insects, very often the name is very descriptive, so it makes it easy for us. Brown rot, what you see very much uh, is that brown coloration to the fruit that was once, you know, a nice round looking fruit. Now that side is flattened, it's turned brown. Uh, what's bad even is we can have infections that we're not noticing yet. We harvest a peach and then very quickly they rot. So if your peaches never last off the tree, that could be part of the problem. A huge issue with this is proper sanitation. If we do a great job with that, we are so much helping ourselves because what happens is you can see in the bottom pictures there, all these mummy fruit and infected fruit are a source of this disease the next season. So when we see these problems, we just need to pull them off the tree. Ideally, we'd probably like to get them out of our orchard area got a couple of trees that's reasonable, got a bunch that may be more of a challenge, um, but we don't want mummy fruit staying in there. And so I guarantee you, if we went around to peach trees in this county, we can find some mummy fruit right now. That'd be an absolute great source of brown rot for next year. What's bad about brown rot is not only does it harm the fruit, it will absolutely attack the tree itself. So it can infect um, the actual uh, stems and leaves, and then it goes into the branches. And again, we can lose branches, we can lose the tree. And so this is something that we don't have curative options on in any way. We wanna use our fungicides, our disease control products as that shield. So we need those in use at the beginning of bloom. Uh, and so the infection occurs during the bloom and if we're not protecting then, it doesn't matter when we start seeing the damage on the tree later. If we have not actually protected it with a fungicide spray, we're going to have some issues most likely. Again, very common disease. Uh, I would find it very rare that you reliably get a peach crop without doing control, if for no other reason than this disease. Black knot. So this is what we find uh, very often on uh, plums especially. And again, the descriptor is a good name uh, for it or very descriptive of it. Uh, it ultimately will girdle a, a branch and, and girdling is just cutting off that vascular flow. So water is not flowing up from the roots, sugar is not flowing down to the roots. And so by interrupting the piping, um, you end up killing branches. And so uh, if left alone, it can absolutely kill trees. Initial infections can be very minor. You can prune those out. Um, you can actually do a fungicide spray to prevent new infections. Typically we do this as a reaction to where we've had the problem before. The number one thing though is pruning. If we don't prune these out, a fungicide program alone will not be effective. You have to prune out the current infections. Peach leaf curl is one that does pop up every now and again. Uh, this is one where uh, it's kind of interesting because you get distorted leaf growth. It is thickened, uh, so it doesn't feel like a normal leaf. It almost looks, you know, plasticky or rubbery. It's very kind of interesting. Uh, we want to look at applying uh, fungicides uh, before bud break in the spring, but we also can apply fungicides late in the fall. So I talked about earlier that kind of there's season long options or possibilities that we might consider with a pest control um, program specifically for peaches and leaf curl, 
uh, we can actually be doing some post-harvest sprays to try to prevent this. So real quickly, kind of the same ideal, before we have the bloom, as we are getting those buds beginning to swell, we look at using, utilizing one of the oil products for smothering those overwinter insects. During the bloom, we can use captan again. Uh, we wanna do that as a precautionary note to prevent brown rot. If you do a great job, if you don't see a lot of brown rot, maybe you can skip that. Um, Typically, uh, we do want to use uh, that fungicide product also on plums and cherries when we have black knot as an issue. Uh, but again, it's only the second step. That first step is pruning. During the cover period, again, the same idea as what we saw with apples, both disease control products, either captan or sulfur, uh, or chlorothalonil. Chlorothalonil is a uh, product that is not labeled for apples, it is labeled for our stone fruits. Uh, and then malathion we see again as an insecticide. Shuck split, which is where basically some sepals on the flowers are broken and fall off because of the growing fruit. Um, so if you wonder what shuck split is, um, you will see those fall off. You'll see them on the ground. You might wonder what in the world's going on if you've never seen that before. Uh, but when that happens, we're again continuing both a disease control as well as insect control, because basically we're controlling insects when we've got fruit present. And so after we've had pollination and fruits growing, that's when we start looking at uh, protecting our fruit from insects. We are looking at cover sprays that are occurring again, you know, every 10 to 14 days. So that is a number of sprays. And I think that's the challenge. You know, if you ask me, should I try to grow peaches? I would say peaches are gonna be the hardest thing you can grow. And a lot of people love fresh peaches. So I understand why they want to, but it is gonna be one that has a more intensive pest control requirement to it compared to some of our other options. Uh, so it is one that I would encourage you to consider what it's gonna to take to have success. And as you can see, the cover sprays continuing. And again, we, we basically keep spraying right up to uh, harvest, um, depending on the product, either two to three weeks before or within one week. Uh, so it depends which product we are utilizing there as our disease control. Because again, that late in the season, even two weeks before harvest, we have to be protecting against brown rot. Uh, it's that much of a problem. And then again, we can do a dormant spray if we are having, for instance, leaf uh, curl on those trees. So real quickly, I thought we'd look at some of the other fruits we might be growing. So grapes, uh, there's a lot of different things that can happen to grapes, but again, the biggest problem I think we have is black rot. It infects not only the fruit, and so you can see the little bitty green uh, grapes there, they are already infected. You can see why it's called black rot, particularly on those little green ones there in the left bottom corner. It also will affect the leaves or foliage, so you can see there those tan spots irregularly shaped on the leaves, as well as some grapes in the background that aren't looking well at all from black rot but it will also attack the vines themselves. So you can see in the upper right, we see some cankering happening on that vine branch there. So this is one that again, if it's a wet year particularly, and you're not doing any sort of fungicide program, you're probably not gonna get grapes. Uh, and again, pruning is important with grapes to increase airflow. So, I mean, it's not just a, if we do fungicides, we're perfectly okay, but fungicides are a critically important part of that. And so certainly uh, you'll see that there's also some insect control products listed. So it's not that they don't have insect problems because they certainly do. Um, but uh, again, I think the diseases are our greatest Achilles heel here. Again, we see, you know, dormant oil sprays in the beginning to look at uh, preventing any overwintering insects or at least reducing their numbers. Uh, you can actually do more than one application. Uh, you can also look at utilizing things like uh, some of the lime sulfur products or captan as well as an early season spray there for diseases. Once we get new shoot growth, uh, we definitely want to be looking at utilizing fungicides such as captan or mancozeb, again, a different fungicide product, as well as something for insects. Uh, Pre-bloom, 
basically the same thing. And, and there again, we see Immunox. And again, uh, utilizing uh, something different uh, on a rotational basis. So uh, looking at uh, rotating between those three different products is probably not a bad idea. And certainly if we've got other species that we're growing, you probably might already have Captain and Immunox. Uh, so that might be a good rotation in and of itself. Um, continuing the same ideal. And again, it's not that they don't get other diseases. There are downy mildews and powdery mildews that can certainly negatively affect our grapes. But I think that uh, black rot is our single uh, most destructive one. And again, basically we're looking about two week intervals on our cover sprays. And again, skipping any sort of insects during the bloom. There is something to be aware of, uh, and that's with malathion. It can cause injury on some particular varieties. So you see those listed there. So you may want to consider that. Uh, one time I knew a, uh, a farm that had just a few apples. They actually were a horse operation, but they had um, viburnums planted along the road next to the apples and they were wanting to do the apples organically, so they were using uh, sulfur products. Sulfur will absolutely knock the leaves off of viburnum. Uh, and so they got a little overspray on the viburnum and they knocked all the leaves off. So sometimes we wanna be careful not just what we're utilizing on the plant we're targeting, making sure we're not having spray drift onto something else that may cause issue. So I wanted to mention spotted wing drosophila. So it's a fruit fly. We don't talk about fruit flies in the garden much. The reason we don't talk about it is because they're not a problem until we uh, got this one. So the problem with this fruit fly is that it has a serrated ovipositor. The ovipositor is what they use to lay eggs. It's technically a modified stinger in most species. Um, the reason it's a problem is that serration allows them to attack undamaged fruit. So fruit flies, as we know them, they attack fruit that's already damaged. This one, however, will attack perfectly intact, lovely fruit and lay its eggs in there. And so then you get these little tiny white larvae or maggots uh, in your fruit. Not very attractive sounding. Um, and so this one is one that is kind of our big focus with a lot of our small fruits that we're going to talk about next. Um, and it's not the only focus we have, but certainly it's an important one. So strawberries, uh, I think it's always worth mentioning diseases with strawberries. There's a lot of diseases that like strawberries. Doing some things like utilizing straw mulch so we have berries not in contact with the ground. And in fact, um, look at uh, some different varieties because some varieties have a more upright growth and they hold their fruit higher. That's a very good thing because there's a lot of different diseases they can get. Uh, and thracnose, we can get botrytis or gray mold. So you see, if you've ever seen those gray fuzzy strawberries in the container when you left it in the fridge too long, that was probably gray mold or botrytis. It's a very common one out there. So it was probably infected when you bought it and given enough time, it grew and produced that fuzzy growth, which is it sporulating or producing spores. And then there's even any number of different leaf diseases we can see. So again, we look at starting pre-bloom uh, whenever we're just getting those buds beginning to show up. Uh, so we do look at utilizing insecticide controls because we've got different uh, insects that will attack those buds as well as those that new growth on the plant. So you can see there, there's a number of different products listed uh, as an option. During the bloom, we do want to use Captan, again, that fungicide as a protectant, particularly for botrytis or gray mold, uh, especially when it's wet weather during the bloom period. Because again, wet conditions uh, are the bigger issue. Um, I would not say we have to worry about powdery mildew ordinarily during the bloom period. So I don't think we need to use Immunox, but that would be a tool that we have available to us. What we do between bloom and harvest is basically maintain that protection in place. And so there's any number of different ways we can do that. So when it comes to the insects, we're looking at using uh, either malathion or carbaryl. We can use Captan. We can use insecticidal soap, particularly if we see spider mites coming in. Spider mites uh, 
uh, do produce a wedding, a webbing rather, and they are very small. So lots of times you take a white piece of paper, knock leaves or growth above it, and it will capture it. Uh, and you'll see these little bitty spots moving around. So it's something that we typically see actually in dry weather more because rain is actually decently effective at keeping their numbers moderately low. Um, there's also uh, slugs that can become a problem. Uh, so don't uh, forget about them. They're out there, especially when we like to use mulch and strawberries to keep those berries up off the ground. We also are creating an environment that's good for slugs. So that's why we want to mention slugs here. So there are some different baits that can be used. Um, so if you're seeing damage on stuff and you're not sure why, it could be slugs. Uh, that's one of those things you're always welcome to send me uh, a picture. And again, you know, what we have with uh, strawberries too is we do want to look at maintaining a spray program on those plants because even after we harvest those plants are growing and basically setting themselves up for next year so we can't just completely abandon strawberries once we harvested if we want them produce well the next year so we do still look at utilizing control program uh, there are some different multi-spray pro uh, multi-purpose sprays that can be used. Uh, so it's not that you must mix your own mixtures. There are some out there that come pre-mixed, but again, uh, avoid anything that has insecticides during the bloom period. Uh, so spotted wing Drosophila, we're gonna sing this exact same recommendation for all these small fruits, but basically when we start getting that berry coloration until we are done harvesting, we need to do something because of spotted wing dystrophila or they will attack our fruit. So spinosad is a organic product that can be used. Um, we can also use malathion again, any of the pyrethrins or pyrethroids. Um, again, uh, so the bonide 8 is actually a permethrin product going back to the earlier question. Uh, and we are limited on strawberries and applying it with eight times within the season. So we do want to think about if we're applying that every, you know, two weeks, uh, how many times, you know, will that last us the whole season or do we have to look at utilizing uh, malathion in concert with it as an alternate? So do consider that limitation. Blueberries, if there was one uh, fruit that you said, I absolutely do not want to spray anything, blueberries would probably be the one I'd point you to. It is more likely, I think, to be successful in that scenario than everything else. It doesn't mean it doesn't have its challenges or we can't have diseases or insect problems because we absolutely can. Uh, but by and large with blueberries, if things are growing well and we're not having a lot of disease problems, we're not gonna be spraying a lot. So we see problems sometimes from Japanese beetles uh, and maybe some other insect pests. But again, we don't necessarily uh, spray prescriptively on a schedule. Uh, spinosad is one that we can use, again, that organic product that can be used on spotted wing drosophila, as well as different caterpillars and flea beetles that we may have problems with. But again, by and large, if we don't have disease problems previously, we're probably not gonna do a lot of control. So this is one, again, if you want that minimal approach, think about that, again, with the berries and the spotted wing drosophila from coloration until we're done harvesting, there's gonna to have to be something done to prevent it. Blackberries and raspberries, uh, both of them are also uh, fairly well suited to a lower input pest control program. If we generally respond to issues we have rather than doing it prescriptively, we do wanna do a good job with sanitation and on the cultural side, so setting things up for success. Both of those will mean that we have less likelihood of needing pesticides. But again, we've got a soft fruit that that spotted wing drosophila can absolutely damage. And so we will still look at that. We can look at doing uh, some disease control because there are a number of different uh, diseases that our uh, brambles can get. So copper, again, if you're looking to do organic is a good option for that. 
Immunox is particularly strong on those rust diseases and there are blackberry rust uh, out there. Uh, so if you've ever seen kind of orange powdery looking stuff on blackberry leaves or stems, that's what you were looking at. And even sulfur is something that can be utilized as well. And sulfur is uh, a product uh, that can be found as uh, organic approved forms as well. And again, we don't necessarily do these just out of um, prescription, but if we are seeing problems, and that's something I want to encourage everybody to do, I want you to be out there with your fruit plants and look at them. Flip leaves over, try to find the insects when there's very few of them rather than they're absolutely covering plants. Um, if you use reading glasses, they need to be with you when you're out there looking at the plants because a lot of this stuff is small. And if you wait until it's big enough to see without the reading glasses, you probably waited too long to have easy control at least. Uh, so certainly, uh, as I was a, a close second to um, blueberries, blackberry and raspberries offer a great option for someone that wants to do minimal controls. Uh, and again, same sort of directions. So as we're getting close to questions, um, just some thoughts on sprayers. Any of the sprayers you see there can be effective and useful. The bigger things to get, the less likely the handheld sprayer on the left is gonna be completely satisfactory for you. Uh, but certainly when things are smaller, when we're talking about brambles uh, and even grapes, that works well. The backpack version of the sprayers, uh, Solo is one brand that's often well reputed, but there's others as well. Those operate fairly well. They get to a higher pressure than just the hand one can get to. And so you also get to carry a bigger volume. So if you've got a larger planting, those work well. When you start getting to where, where things are bigger and it's taking too long, you start looking at something like the electric powered uh, sort of general horticulture lawn sprayers like you see on the pool behind there. Those can work well. You can uh, create wands for them that maybe have even multiple spray nozzles and not just a single one. Uh, one that's an interesting option that I've used actually in vegetables before is the backpack sprayers, the mist blowers. Uh, those can work well, particularly if you've got um, standard sized trees, maybe you inherited those as part of your property. Those can work well to really get you up in that canopy well. Uh, certainly much better than the backpack or the hand pump would ever do. So it's not that you must run out and buy these. I, I will not uh, corroborate to a spouse that I said you must have a backpack <laughs> sprayer to be successful, but they are fun to play with. Um, so certainly, you know, as you grow your orchard or your other fruit plantings, it may be that you look at upping your tools that you have available to help you with that. Uh, but the, again, they can all be effective. So some further reading. One thing that I really like to point you to, uh, University of Kentucky, these were actually developed for commercial growers, but there's no reason home fruit growers can't use them. These are scouting guides. So you may sometimes hear integrated pest management. All that is is basically utilizing not just um, uh, chemical resources, but other things as well. And what's great about these is they're great pictures, they're modern pictures, they're up to date. It's not just diseases, it's not just insect damage. It also shows as nutrient disorders. So is that a leaf spot because you have insects attacking or a disease, or maybe it's because you're not getting the right nutrition. This is gonna help you kind of point that uh, in one direction or another. Obviously, I'm always available for you to send me pictures or give me a call and come out and take a look. Um, so don't think you have to do this in the absence of assistance. Uh, but this is one of those things that you start looking through these that will help you learn what you need to be watching for when you're out there looking at your plants. So I really like these as a tool for home gardeners. Another thing to point you to, if you're not familiar with this site yet, this is kind of the repository for all of UT's horticulture related publications. So uthort.com. If you click on the educational resources tab, you will see a bunch of different categories pop up. Uh, that, and so you'll find uh, fruits as one, but everything horticulture under the sun is on this website. Uh, it's primarily UT publications, but they have grabbed some from other universities around the region that are good too. So it doesn't exclude something just because it's not from UT. So I, I think that's a positive. 